Welcome to all uh, who are watching this at home and I trust that you find this helpful and uh, edifying. Today's a really good example of the uncertainty that we've lived in the last five months due to COVID. For four weeks we resumed meeting back at the church uh, in groups of 20 and now here we are back uh, recording doing things remotely again. So once again we need to adapt. Adapt was part of what the early church had to do. First when Jesus departed from earth. Then as the young church went through various stages uh, like when the Gentiles began to accept the good news and all of a sudden there was all these different cultures coming into the church and then as we know the threat the real threat uh, and the perceived threat of persecution uh, indirect and direct persecution so the early church has been there before but by the grace of God that church flourished and the gospel spread to the world that's the sort of church that we want to be too a flourishing church which doesn't wait which doesn't wait for the perfect time to share in what God is doing in his world so today we're starting a 12-week series on being a flourishing church it's a series uh, where different leaders of the Baptist Union of Victoria uh, have contributed and we'll be using their structure but also adding our own thoughts and insights and so uh, you, you see that it's in three sections uh, firstly it's about congregational life where we look at discipleship engagement hospitality diversity then we look at congregational character and we look at leadership identity structures and processes and innovation and then we look at mission uh, community engagement evangelism justice partnerships before we start our first topic which is discipleship i want to take you back to last week uh, I realize that some of you watching today probably didn't get a chance uh, to, have to, to look at uh, the tape from last week. So I want to quickly remind us all of what, uh, what was said. And what, it, what, what we said was that no matter what else we do, we want to be people who commit to these four essentials. And here they are. Thanks, David. Next one. Stay close to God. Maintain our relationship with God. Make the scriptures a way of life. Stay connected to our brothers and sisters. Learn to love everyone. And I want to draw your attention to the third one for a moment. We read last week that beautiful passage in Acts chapter 2 summarizing how the early Christians cared for one another. I just want to bring to your attention that in these last weeks there has been some tremendous uh, practical caring for one another in this, in, in this church. Uh, there has been uh, people providing meals for other people, uh, there have been uh, just kind of pastoral things, phone calls and things going on, there's been hospitality and there's been uh, great generosity. And those things are what the early church reminded us uh, is what fellowship is all about. That is true fellowship. Uh, and that's exactly what we mean when we talk about the importance of connecting with our brothers and sisters. In this time of COVID, may we maintain those high standards. And thank you to all of you who are already doing that. And along those lines, um, I, I would like to suggest that in our cluster groups, we might take that to another level too. Now, I know that some of you have been managing already to connect in your cluster groups um, digitally um, and, and doing various things, using various kinds of um, what, what's available to us to do that. And 
if you want to do it, and I'm not even asking that the leaders do it, I'm just saying if you in your cluster group would like to initiate something with others in your cluster group, go ahead and see what happens and see if you can establish some kind of weekly getting together just to be able to check in on one another. That would be a really great thing. So we come now to uh, this first in this series of discipleship. And um, I'm going to go back a long time, a long time in my spiritual walk and a long time in years, uh, to the, the last year of my high school years and the first couple of years uh, when I was at uni. It was a time when I had come to understand the significance of what the Lordship of Christ meant for me. And, uh, and so I was sort of on a bit of a, bit of a high, you know, I was really uh, very engaged and learning lots and so on. And one of the leaders of the Christian Union at, um, at Monash uh, invited myself and a couple of other people to a, a regular, like a weekly prayer time. What I understood, now I was a pretty, pretty kind of reserved sort of person, but what I understood that he was doing was that he had found uh, a, a few people, we were all first year uni students, all Christians, and he'd found a few people who he uh, could see were passionate. And he started to meet with us and, and what I noticed about this leader was that wherever he met me, whether it was in that prayer group when there was just a few of us there, or whether it was at the uni campus, and, uh, and you know, at a uni campus you just walk around and you can get totally lost, there's so many people around. But if he met me uh, just, just haphazardly, uh, he would stop, and even if he was in a hurry, he would stop and he would have a little chat, and he always left me thinking, he's interested in me. Who I am mattered to him, and what I did mattered to him. He would ask me how things were going, and so on. And then it struck me uh, a bit later that he was discipling us, myself and those other people that met in the prayer group. He picked up on our pattern, and he wanted to help that passion to grow. All those three people, incidentally, became Christian leaders uh, in, in their future. But it started because we saw someone who was worthy of following. To be a disciple is to be a follower of Jesus. So in the early part of his ministry, Jesus went looking for disciples. And because I've been reading Matthew, uh, there's sort of similar passages we could, we, could, uh, we could encounter in all the Gospels, but I'm taking this from Matthew. So here's one example uh, from uh, Matthew chapter 4. Reading from Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, one day, as Jesus was walking, sorry, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. A very creative student at Bible College from many years ago when I was there gave a devotion on this passage and commenting on the shock of Jesus' terms of following him in this passage, uh, he said, 
There were the disciples with their mouths wide open. There was Zebedee, their father, with his mouth wide open. There were the fish with their mouth wide open. It is a bit of a shock, isn't it? This teacher, whom they hardly knew, comes along while they're doing their job of fishermen that they've probably known all their lives. And they're continuing the family business just like many of their mates were doing. And he calls them to follow him. But look how Matthew describes their response. They left their nets at once and followed him. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Wow. What a radical thing to ask someone to do in a culture where family ties are so strong, along with loyalty and obligation and all those other things, not to mention the importance of making a living. Now, I've included some questions in the order of service that uh, you would have got, uh, and I'm inviting anyone who wants to, to join us uh, in a Zoom meeting at 3 o'clock today, I'll uh, uh, put the, uh, the link in, or the link will be in your order of service, uh, at 3 o'clock this afternoon, and we can discuss together some of the questions uh, that come out of, out of this message today. Uh, because I think there are some really important questions, even about this passage that we've just read. Um, it just gives us an opportunity to... to um, uh, chew that over a bit and try and sort of work out what the implications are. But can I also say, leading from what I was saying a bit earlier, if you would like in your cluster group to make a, a, a regular thing of, of meeting weekly and discussing uh, these Sunday messages, which uh, while we're doing the series, we will have questions every week. Uh, and if you want to do that in your cluster group, well, by all means, uh, try and yeah, organise yourselves and do that. That would be really great. The group of believers that Matthew's Gospel was first sent to would have also been shocked by this call of Jesus to his disciples. Now, I don't believe that God wants us to abandon our parents and all walk away from our jobs. But I do believe the call to discipleship today is as radical as it was for the first disciples. And we don't want to downplay that. So, are all Christians called to be disciples? In Acts 11.26, in the church at Antioch, we're told that that was the first time the disciples were called Christians. What were they before that? In the previous 10 chapters of Acts, they were disciples. The same people. Disciples are Christians and Christians are disciples. There are not two levels. There are not two categories. We are all called to be disciples. So what is a disciple? The Gospels give, give us lots of clues of what a disciple is and obviously we haven't got uh, time to, to talk about uh, uh, many of those things. But here's a couple. In Matthew chapters 5 to 7, um, which uh, is about a very um, uh, esteemed teaching called the Sermon on the Mount, um, at the start of that of chapter 5, uh, in verse 2, it's clear that though there were other people present when, when Jesus was speaking, the teaching that Jesus gave was primarily aimed at the disciples. And when he's wrapping it all up in chapter 7, he says in verse 21, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will 
of my Father in heaven will enter. So a disciple is he or she who does the Father's will. John 8.31 is a really important verse. Jesus said, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. A disciple evaluates everything in his or her life according to the truth that is in Jesus. Their character, the way they conduct their relationships, their decisions and actions, their priorities in life, are always being lived in relation to the truth that's in Jesus. It's a daily, ongoing way of life. Children can be disciples. As we introduce our children to Jesus and encourage them to share their toys and obey their parents and respect people who are different and be kind to people, they have begun on the road to discipleship. And that highlights the fact that discipleship is a process. Maybe we have been too eager or rigid about insisting that people pray the believer's prayer and it sort of marks a time of before and after. Now I recognise that sometimes that might be really helpful, but I think discipleship, um, the, the, the gospel shows us that discipleship is a process, it's a lifelong process. And maybe it is a more of a process where increasingly, as we get to know this Jesus better and better, our lives are aligning, aligning more and more with his. The result being that we become people of the kingdom. That's why we call our little group here Kids for the Kingdom. It's an ongoing process of discipleship. More and more, a disciple becomes rooted in Jesus. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Also, a disciple is someone who forms other disciples. Jesus himself established that pattern. After his resurrection, in a room with the disciples, he said, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. John 20, 21. In what's called the Great Commission, he asked his disciples to do what? Not to make converts, not to get people to sign on the, on the dotted line. No, he said, go and make disciples. And in case that's still not clear for us, uh, this is what Paul said to his disciple Timothy. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now, teach these truths to other, to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. 2 Timothy 2.2 2. There is a discipleship cycle and we're all called to do that, to be part of that. We've already looked at the cost of discipleship when we looked at the call of the first disciples uh, in that early passage. Following Jesus means putting him before everything and everyone else. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a powerful book called The Cost of Discipleship. And he wrote it because he was concerned that Christians were lulled into a kind of complacency because they thought, oh, well, uh, my sins are forgiven now, as if they could now get off the discipleship train. And he wanted to encourage people to understand that discipleship 
was for, for all of life, no matter what it cost. But I do want to close uh, today by reminding us about some of the rewards of being a disciple of Jesus. And I'm just going to mention four. Uh, if you're taking up that uh, challenge about reading one of the Gospels, uh, you've still got just under five months to do that, uh, you will notice a lot more uh, of what it means, what, what are the rewards of being a disciple of Christ. But here are four of them. After speaking about leaving family for his sake, Jesus said to his disciples, they, in other words, those are people who leave their loved ones for the sake of Jesus, he said they will receive a hundredfold. Now he wasn't talking about financial gain or anything like that. Uh, I think he was referring to the fact that uh, in some ways, our family grows and grows as we remain uh, a disciple of Jesus. Uh, that, that's in Matthew 19, 29, by the way. In another place, when they'd been out on mission and came back rejoicing, he said to them privately, many have wanted to see these things that you see, but haven't. There is great blessing for disciples. There's a great intimacy that Jesus shares with his disciples. Now you all know uh, this, this reference in John 10.10 10, where it says the thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. And then Jesus saying, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And the last, on which I think is, uh, is one of the most precious, is when he said in John 15, 14 and 15, You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. Last week, uh, if you remember, we said Abraham was one of the few people that God calls his friend. And it's true in terms of the Old Testament. But anyone who is a disciple of Jesus has the honour and status of friendship. Could there be a higher privilege than being a friend of Jesus? Do we want to be a flourishing church in these challenging times? It starts with being a disciple of Jesus. May Bacchus Marsh Baptist Church be a church full of Jesus' disciples. Let's pray. Father God, what a, what a privilege it is that you have introduced us through your Son to walk in this journey of discipleship. Lord, what a, what a great way to, to learn more about ourselves, to learn about you, and to learn ways in which we can make an impact on this world. Uh, and, and even while we are being transformed by you, that we can also help to transform this world. Lord, this is a great privilege, and I ask that you will help each one of us to apply ourselves to become more and better disciples of Jesus. And we pray this uh, knowing that we cannot do it without the help of your Holy Spirit. So we commit ourselves to you in this journey. Amen.